Greetings and salutations and welcome to this episode of Playwright Spotlight. Before we begin, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, share this video with a friend, and leave a comment down below. If you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, be sure to leave a five-star review and subscribe to the channel. My guest today is a playwright, novelist, poet, and film and TV writer, actor, director, and producer. He has over 20 plays published by Dramatic Publishing, Smith & Krauss, and Applause Books, and include Caravaggio, Gangster Apparel, Machiavelli, one Shot, One Kill, and Bird Brain, with productions of these plays off-Broadway, Chicago, Melbourne, Cyprus, Rome, Paris, and London. He has received numerous grants for writing, including a Mary Roberts Reinhardt grant for playwriting and a Cultural Council Foundation for Poetry and Playwriting. He was a guest of the Chicago Humanities Theater Festival for his play Caravaggio, and he has a master's in comparative English literature from Columbia University and lectured at NYU in the master's program in playwriting and film writing and continues to lecture at Queens College. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Richard Vettier. How are you, Richard? Good, James. Thanks. That was a Thank you. The, fun introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vettieri. Vettieri. Yes. Vettieri is good. Hold on. Uh, so this is, this is a, this, I don't know, maybe, maybe you'd want, maybe you'd like to know this. This, you are going to be my final guest for season two. Great. We're wrapping up our, our second year and I'll, I'll start season three. Uh, with my next one so thanks for uh, for for being my guest on my on my season ending i heard good uh, things about it and people know it so i'm glad i'm here thank you very much appreciate it so let's i want to start right off the bat with this because we haven't covered this in past episodes mm -hmm. can can you go through the grant writing process when it comes to getting a grant for playwriting yeah um gotta remember those grants were in the late 70s early 80s and okay. boy were they a lot easier and more accessible okay yeah yeah um i think the mary robin Hart, roberts reinhardt foundation was i filled out an application which was very easy i sent a play i was working on and they sent me money um the cultural council foundation uh CETA grant is pretty famous now um back in 78 79 jimmy carter who was president decided that artists should get ten thousand dollars a year but he limited it to new york city to 500 of us that included wow. from dancers to poets to playwrights to directors and i was running some arts programs as a 25 year old in queens and was pretty amazed that i got the grant and not only was the grant for one year, but it was extended for three. So I got $10,000 a year in the late 70s. And then once the grant was over, we got unemployment because it was we were paid as if it was a job. Did I have to fill out anything? Absolutely not. <laughs> I was approached for an interview and got it. So I'm working in a production now of, of a play of mine. I'm trying to get my play Zaguada off Broadway. It was just done at ensemble stage in North Carolina and found this great kid who has a master's in how to sell tickets in theater, how to fill out theater grants. So we're bringing him aboard to help us get to, we already raised some um, what we call donation money because it's a donation. You know, theater now is in a place where off Broadway commercial theater is almost non-existent. All my commercial off Broadway theater friends don't want to produce commercially anymore. So it's now the non-for-profits. And the non-for-profits usually produce playwrights who have, <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble, have gone to Yale. The artistic director has gone to Yale. Everyone, their agents have gone to Yale. So it's just kind of, so, um, you know, guys like me that wanna get plays done commercially off Broadway, we need to find, uh, you know, those backers, those, those, in, those donations, those organizations that um, actually want to see theater done. It is a lot of work for playwrights today. Do you know, do you, since you're working, I'm, I'm shocked that there's a master's in this, in this area as far as like. Me too. Mark, I'm Mark, shocked Mark. When you me. Yeah. <laughs> what do you, do you have any idea how, what, what's changed in grant writing in this regard? You know, um, like how much more complex it's gotten and, and what, are they asking yeah. for reasonable things? Yes, and you know, it, it has gotten com uh, complex. He actually found the grant money to get my play Zaguada produced on, at the ensemble stage in North Carolina by going to their arts council. 
and it had to show diversity. It had to show a, a, um, an, an issue that it deals with that is cultural. There's a lot of things that weren't there many years ago. They were looking for quality, which is also, you know, um, a, a difficult thing to define. So I learned from him on my production that he got the grant money that we could have an equity production in a theater that was there for 20 years. So it is a lot more complicated. I'm, I'm always, as a writer, sending my plays out, you know, as, as a playwright. I'm always sending them out to places because um, I'm writing them and I want to see where they may fit. Um, but I do find a lot of the festivals, really the quality of the work is not as significantly important anymore as if it meets the agenda that that theater company is looking for. I saw that happen in poetry when I, in the 70s. Um, I got my master's from Columbia in 74, and then I started sending my poems out. But each literary magazine had a very narrow scope of what their agenda was. So it wasn't about good poetry as much as did you fit into this category. And, hey, you know, that's, that's – um, Arthur Miller didn't go through that. But, you know, right, sure. we, we go through that. Um, and that's why, like, in New York City – and I was thinking about this before we spoke, and I mentioned it at a dinner the other night – that um, I would walk through the streets of New York and there were theaters on every, every street. Sure. And I had plays produced everywhere. Those theaters are gone. You know, we're, we're wondering, theater is not as significant in New York City like it was. Off-Off-Broadway was happening everywhere, everywhere. Um, now I'm wondering, is it regional theater? I'm not sure. I'm not sure where theater is going right now. You know, do you think that do you think do you um, I don't want the credit's not the right word. Do you blame that on on COVID? Is that all? Is that all? Oh, COVID, well, what COVID did was crush what was falling apart. You know what I okay, mean? It, it was already it was already taking a yeah. downturn. Yeah, because New York City is I mean, man, Manhattan is so busy. It's insane. It's back to the way I just saw some report just two days ago that it's actually caught up to 2019 the amount of people visiting, everybody wants to come here. It's great. But what I'm saying is that those little theaters, the rents are, the rents were going up way before. They just can't afford it. You know, the little theater companies, you know, I'm, I'm talking to a couple of really good theaters, Lucille Hotel here, um, primary stages. You know, my one of my favorite, where I would hold a birthday party every few years, um, the Cherry Lane is now no longer a theater. You know, um, Readings have now taken over productions, which you know that. that. That started happening about 20 years ago. People were thrilled to have readings. Um, I, you know, I write plays to have them produced. I want to watch right. actors off book. I want a set. Otherwise, I'd you know, try to write some more movies and TV. But that's sure. what I love about theater. We're going through that here now. I mean, I don't know. If the theater's going through this. I don't know. Hopefully, it's going to be a rebirth. And, um, I was well, here's about the good news, James. Um, and 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 my, a longtime good buddy Israel Harvitz had said to me, uh, said this to me: uh, theater will always be around because actors need to act. And thank God for actors, because yeah. actors will keep the theater going. You know, um, I'm not as you know there aren't as many really good directors as much. You know, there of course there's some really good ones, but I got to say, you know, I'm finding. That the actors are the ones that want, you know, I'm meeting more and more young actors. I'm, I really love to meet young actors because they're the future. And, you know, they're the ones that are looking for show plays. They read the plays. They're looking for the parts to do. You know, that's what it's about. So thank God for them. Um, but I think they'll keep it alive. I'm not, I'm not, I'd love having a play done in someone's living room. It doesn't matter anymore. That's sure. where off, off Broadway started. And you could experiment. You could do this. You, could, you know, once you start a, an off-Broadway play, the budgets are insane. Yeah. You know, they're insane. And and people, one thing, and you're absolutely right, COVID did stop people. I know some regional theaters right outside New York. Their Saturday audiences have disappeared. People are staying home. You know, um, they, they've lost, they say about 75% of their audience still comes. But Saturday is the worst. It's less than 50%. I don't know what that is. Also, we know, you know, that most of the theater-going audience are older people. 
and they're concerned about, you know, they don't want to drive, they don't want to do this. But I have to say, I had a little play done in a little theater out here in Queens, and I loved the audience was less, they were 30 and younger, and oh, wow. packing the house, packing the house. And that's what I'm looking for, younger audience. Love my older audiences because I got the money. But, you know, we're looking to generate, and I'm not sure the schools are doing, I know the schools are not doing that. Um, so somebody has to do it. And I, and I feel it's part of my job as a playwright to get audiences to see the theater. Sure. You know, and, and, and so that's what I'm doing when I'm, when I'm getting involved, at least in New York. You, you mentioned uh, a, a lack of good directors. From a playwriting perspective, what, what makes a good director? Um, someone who knows, first off, they read the play and get it, and then they want to interpret the play as is for the audience. That's their job. If there's something they don't understand, that's great. Talk to me. I just had a Zoom meeting with a director, and she had a couple of questions. I thought they were very good. Um, but sometimes, like in readings, you know, I'm an actor too. Directors want, like, the actors to be running around on stage in a reading. Can we hear the play first? Sure. I did this with a big star who wants to do my play. We got three days of an equity. I guess it was a couple of grand to pay all the actors and everybody. And he never read the play. He was moving people from chair to chair for three days. Hmm. It's crazy. You know, like, let the, dire the director should sit back, allow the play, get into the audience, and then – if there are things that are not clear, fine, let's talk about it, you know? Um, and I'm finding less and less theater directors know how to do that, or maybe they're not, I don't know. When I was growing up, I don't know how people became, in the theater, I don't know how people became directors, but I trusted that they were directing, you know? Um, sure. Now, I, it, it, I also hear from schools, I taught at NYU theater, and it, the focus was on the script, that, the directors are not taught to interpret the play, but to um, kind of put the, um, their impression on the play. I get that a lot from young playwrights. And I get and I, a lot of young playwrights tell me they get these agreements from directors that after the reading, the director has the right to direct it for the next five years. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Go to the Drama's Guild. Get this out of here. You know? Right, exactly. I, that just, that's baffling to me. I mean, I come from, a, from when, I, when I approach a piece, I just... I just I I just want to tell the story. That's it. It's yeah. all I want to do. I don't I don't want to have all this, you know, all these li different layers of like, oh well, what does that mean? Just tell the story. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I'm not going to try to do these hidden things like, oh, what what did that mean? Or you know, to where it's I don't. I guess that where you're not walking out the door saying what what did that mean? Well, you should know yeah. what it means. I think you know. I don't just tell the story. I think all plays have that story there. I, I just don't know why everything else needs to be complicated. And, and well, you know, think about it in film. You know, I tell my screenwriting students, first off, don't write a scene unless it's going to be shot. <laughs> all right. right. Um, as a director myself, you know, I, I want and and, you know, some really brilliant screenwriters have talked to me about this shootable scenes, you know, know how to write a scene that can be shot. Right. And, um, my favorite is from Tony Gilroy. I say it all the time. A lot of white on the page, you know, a lot of white, you know, there is a director who's going to take your script and shoot it. So you direct the movie as you're writing it. And if you do that, they're not going to be around, going to be able to screw around with the script as you've written it. Obviously right. you sell the rights and they can change it. So film, film directors to me, I think have a better sense of that you know, the responsibility of telling the story that is written in the screenplay than stage directors, I feel. Not all. There's some terrific ones out there. But um, screenwriting is a gift in itself because you got to learn how to write for the camera. And that is that is something that needs to be learned and taught. You sure. know, let the camera tell the story, not the words. Sure. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to playwriting, of course, I mean, you, you, you've got pretty much all dialogue. So there's probably going to be a lot more black on the page. How, in that regard, how much, how much stage direction do you write? Oh, um, in the first draft, I usually write a little bit more than is needed in the second draft. I start to cut it. Um, I've been lucky. I've been in the PD workshop, uh, at the actor's studio. I, I was there actually when, once again, Israel Harvard started it. 
in the New York Playwrights Lab in, uh, I think, 78. And I um, assume that's play, play, play development? Yeah, it's Playwright Director's Workshop. So you Got get it. to bring in, yeah, yeah, if you're one of those that are there, you get to bring in 20 minutes of your play every few months, work on it. And um, what I love about it is I go right into rehearsal when I'm going to present 20 minutes. And I start to edit my directions. Um, I've been working with uh, my partner, Maya Wampuzic, who's an actress director. And it's been wonderful because we've done five plays in Zaguada I developed there. Then went to being published by Dramatic Publishing and then a production. Um, and now, believe it or not, I'm adapting one of my published novels, The Writer's Afterlife, for the stage in the PDW. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I overwrite the first draft and then cut, 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 cut. Um, and when you go into rehearsal, you know, you cut again. It's really interesting. The best film scripts I've ever read are shooting scripts. Why do I say that? Because I do creditation a lot for the Writers Guild. You know, the credits, writers are always fought, fighting for the credits. So for the Writers Guild, I've been asked a lot to do that credit arbitration. And the best screenplays I've ever written, I'm uh, sorry, read, are shooting scripts of those movies. Everything is in the screenplay is up on the screen. Everything on the screen is in the screenplay. So talk about stage directions. Yeah, like I, I am, I'm just thinking now when, and, and I have a lot of plays published, I do go through the stage directions and cut more than I would normally when I'm doing my early drafts. That That's for me, you know, it, it's not really for the actors. It's for me to see, hey, I, am I getting this across with a move? Am I getting this across? And so that's a really good question, but it's something that I know when I'm acting in a play, I pay no attention to the stage directions. Um, like all good actors, and I'm, I don't consider myself a really good actor, but all good actors find what's there, and then you get right back. You know, like my friend Matt Penn said, you know, we're going to cut a lot of stuff, and we'll probably get right back to what you wrote, and I, and it happens ninety nine percent of the time. Do you have any horror stories? Uh -oh. As far as like any of your plays, like oh. Uh, you know, when he said 99% of the time it comes back, I mean, is there anything that where somebody's tackled it and just totally? Yes, of course. I had a, a director. Um, we were doing a play down at, uh, I got a poster back there in my office. Um, uh, Painting X is on the moon. I'm not going to mention his name because we're friends again. But he, he, when I went to L.A., I had meetings and I came back and he went through my whole script and changed stuff. And I said, you can't do that. It's called a copyright. I own it. You can't do this. And then I had a producer who was going to bring uh, a play of mine that's published now and produced before or later. And uh, he, he sent me a FedEx of his changes in my script. Um, and I said, no, you, you can't do that. It, that got me really upset, that one. Um, I made the mistake of opening the package late at night. And... Mm -hmm. um, you know, because we were all set. We had the theater and everything, and the production did not happen. Um, it, it's it, – the horror stories sometimes come from casting. A director wants someone that you're not as fond of, but you know it'll get the play up. Um, mm. we, you know, playwrights, we go through a lot, you know, but we know. We know, like, all about Eve. I mean, we know all the things. It's all about personalities. I wish somebody had told me that when I was younger. I had great mentors. And, you know, it's all about people. And it's it's they don't teach us how to deal with people. They're people, <laughs> you know. Right. Directors, actors are people, and they have their thoughts. Um, I'm always thrilled when I got a good actor. I'm like, good, thank God, whatever you want to do, man, let's do it, you know. And 99 percent of the time, they're there because they love the play and they want to do the play. I've had I've had I've had actors who yell, yelled at my director. Uh, Kevin Anderson was doing my play Hail the Hero on the General Motors Playwrights Theater. And he, he just went after the director. He would not do something. And he was right. And I was so glad he spoke up. And then I defended him and got thrown off the set until he told the producer, no, I want him here. So, you know, as the playwright, I got thrown off. Um, and and what, being an actor now and a bit of a director, I have a lot more ease with working with people in their different points of view. I don't get as crazy. When I was a young playwright, when an actor didn't say the line the first way, I got crazy. Now it's like, no, 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 no. And and I say, hey, any questions, man, just ask me, you know. 
is that a, is there a i don't think a conflict of interest is not the right word but isn't there like a a butting of the heads of if, if an actor is going to the playwright opposed to the director isn't they aren't they kind of yeah know, yeah i think the drama is skilled i don't understand. know if it's changed we're not supposed to talk to the actors and the actors are not supposed to talk to us um and i'm wondering if that's changed someone told me it did uh i think i think it's a really good rule um but i'm talking about when we're deep in rehearsal and getting close sometimes actors ask me stuff and i always say talk to the director sure and, and you know tell i'm glad you told me but talk to the director because i ain't stepping over there about you know wow. sure i you know i had an experience like that um i was directing a friend's piece and uh, and, and uh, i want to ask you something about this if you find if you've had that same uh, mentality sometimes when you after you've written a piece but she would go to the playwright the actress would go to the playwright and ask questions and she's like just go talk to james I, I i trust his i trust his vision i trust what he's doing go talk to james and i think the reason why is because some of the questions that she, the actress was asking is like things that i don't even think the playwright knew mm -hmm. sometimes you get into that flow and it's like you're the we as actors have a tendency to to read it deeper into thing and the, oh there must be a reason behind this there must be a deeper reason behind it rather than you know that's that's just the flow that came out at that moment i mean do you find that sometimes where it's just like i that's just i was in that that zone and i don't know where what it's brilliant but i don't think that there's this deeper meaning or you know there's not necessarily a reason why this character in this moment is doing this in particular thing and it's oh, yeah that's a really good an actor to figure out what that is yeah yeah it, it actually just happened two days ago where we're doing a zoom reading for producers and um before the rehearsal the actor asked me something and i and i and the director was there on zoom and i said i don't know I'm writing it. I'm I'm learning about the play as I'm writing it. Right. Why, you know, the question is, why does he do this? I don't know. Let's find out. You know, because I, when you're writing a play, it's like a universe of molecules, and you you can't know every molecule. You just go like Ray Bradbury said it really great. When I write, I just hook onto the lead character and follow where they go, and that's usually me. I write from my subconscious. I'm not a literal. I don't sit there and go, oh, this scene's going to happen in this scene. Um, that's the difficulty of writing screenplays because it's really structure. But writing novels, now I'm writing a collection of short stories. Um, and uh, my new novel just came out. And, I, you know, I'm reading it and going, wow, where did they come up with that? Or how did that happen? You know, I, I did a third draft because I, I was throwing the novel away after two drafts. It was terrible. And then I did a third draft somewhere, and I don't remember where. And then I picked up the play, the novel before I threw it out and read it and went, oh, my God, this works really well. The first publisher I sent it to loved it and, and published it. But I don't remember doing that rewrite. I really don't. So an actor has to trust the the instinct of the, of the playwright. They got to know the playwright. And the playwright's not always right either. Sometimes, you know, just today a director brought up a thought, and I remember having that thought years ago about my play and never really solved it. So, but I, I go with it. It's all about the subconscious and I go with it. And when an actor asks me something that is somewhere that I don't have a conscious answer, I just say, let's find out, let's find out. Because as an actor, you do ask questions. And it's really funny as an actor myself, I never do. I just go at what's there and find it. And I find learning from really good actors, actors find it. You know, they really find it if the material is good. It doesn't have to be great, but good. They find it. Um, so that is a, that is funny because it happened two days ago. Yeah, it's it's, it's it's surprising. Like just sometimes it's just like you get into that. You know, like I said, that zone. I mean, yeah. Stephen, I don't know if you're a Stephen Pressfield fan. Um, or if you've read any of his books? Um, the War of Art, uh, yeah. turning pro and and do the work, and then his follow up, his fourth book was Nobody Wants to Read Your Shit, but. <laughs> He, 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 in his first book, the, the war of art, he talks about the muses and when you show up, it, he, t he talks about resistance and the, like, you know, the fact that we'll avoid writing at all cost, you know, and, and do the most mundane, boring things before we sit down to write. And then, but if you, if you do it and you show up, then the muses will be there to feed your psyche and, and the ideas will flow. 
So um, it's, it's a really short read. You could probably read it in about 45 minutes, but it is brilliant. But and, you know, with your with your background in history, I'm sure that um, well, you've already been me, to those places. I, I've never had writer's block. Um, since high school, I've been, I was called prolific, and I thought it was an insult. I had to look the word up. Um, <laughs> And I still, uh, this is how I write. I write. I, I don't have a problem. I don't put things off. I write. Um, do I think, yeah, some stories I could think years, years, literally years before I write. I need to have a title before I write. I need to have a metaphor, which is the title, before I write. Because every once in a while, when I'm thinking of what's going to happen as I'm following it, the title brings me back in. Um when I was teaching at NYU, the master's program at screenwriting, not the playwriting, but screenwriting, every third student at about page 20 or 30 would say, Professor, I don't know what to do next. And I said, yeah, you know, you know what it is. We're on the operating table here. You got you got a um, you got a plot problem. <laughs> you didn't figure out the story in the plot before. And that's screen screenwriting. You just started. That's why screenwriting is difficult. It's structure. You do have to think it all out. That's why I prefer being hired to do all that work. Otherwise, as a poet, because I started as a poet, I love just let my subconscious go. Mm -hmm. Follow my characters. Discover what's happening. That's why writing is so much fun for me. I don't know what's going to happen. I really don't know what's going to happen. I have a big idea. Like like I'm adapt when I adapted The Third Miracle, um, my novel was unpublishable. It was 550 pages, the third one. Wow. And my agent in William Morris, um, it's a long story, so I won't bore you, but eventually she put it out there. She just sent it to people. And we sold it to Coppola's company. And then I got the job of writing the screenplay, a 550 page novel. Mm -hmm. And I had said to her, this, 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 no, it's all over the place. But when I took the novel and put it in the three act structure, I cut 250 pages. The novel was immediately published, and the screenplay was eventually made. Um, you know, another writer came aboard. Francis brought another writer in. We wrote, rewrote. We have you know writing credit together. But that three act structure really helped me with my novel, The Third Miracle. And um, you know, it is all about. It's a craft. Listen, it's all about craft. Sure. And we don't get to apprentice that much anymore. I mean, I know they call going to school that, but how about sitting in a director's class for a year? Learn what directors do. Sit in and what actors do. You're writing a play that has collaboration. Same thing with short films. They do that a little bit better. You know, make a short film. So you know what where you know what end of a camera works. You know, like how do how do I how do actors work in front of a camera different than when they're on stage? Blah blah blah. This is stuff they should teach. But what they can't teach is coming up with ideas. That's what they can't teach. What do you want to write about? I tell everybody when I, you know, students, what's your point? I even told that when I was at NYU, please don't push that they have to have a theme. And I realized because that's really hard, they don't want the students to struggle. I always ask them, so what's your point? Why are you writing this and why do you want me here? You know, I ask myself that. And I just read someone, Don, I can't remember who it is. Um, somebody I respect says, listen, I write for myself. And I think that's what, you know, I think we do write for ourselves and we sure. hope other people like it. Right. You know? How much, how many classes in a master's program can, can you really get when it comes to playwriting or even, a, it, you know, I just, I'm, it's like about playwriting one, playwriting two. I'm like, what do we, I just I I've, I'm always baffled about what 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 are the benefits of going through a master's program in playwriting? There's only so many there's only so many classes you can teach in that in that realm. Sure, I mean what I was taught was that they had to write a play. So when I was teaching at NYU in the master's program, it was they had to write a play. I've never taken a writing class in my life. My master's is in comparative English literature from Columbia. So I wanted to study literature. How did I write plays? I read them. Mm -hmm. I would go and buy plays. And then I would go see plays. And that's what I mean about apprenticeship. I learned, oh, wow, they could do this. 
I could do that. I remember Steve Gerges coming up to me at um, second stage. We were backstage in the green room. We were doing something together. And he asked to meet me, and I asked you know, to be introduced to him. We didn't know each other. And he said, I want to thank you because I saw your play, I think it was Rockaway Boulevard and my other play, Gangster Apparel, at this theater in the Bronx. And he said, I then realized watching your plays that I could write about my working class characters. So he learned that by going to see another play. Um, the problem in when you're teaching plays, the professors pick plays that they kind of relate to. And I'm finding that a lot of theater now, it's coming out of writing schools. So who could afford writing schools? You know what I mean? That I, I want to see plays that are about all, you know, all classes in, in the world. You know, that's what interests me. I saw a Raising in the Sun uh, on TV on Channel 13 and went, oh, my God, I could write about my world. And I did because I saw a Raising in the Sun. Um, and the other play I saw on TV when I was young was called uh, This Woman's Not for Burning, a British play. And I went, oh, my God, I could write smart comedy. And it's people will do it. That's how I learned. You know, um, I never took a class, never took a writing class in my life, but um, there's a lot of people out there that take them now. Yeah, I, and I feel like sometimes it's just you're just getting regurgitation of what somebody else learned. You know, I, I don't know how much you can really gain from that. The one thing that, uh, that I always do when I, when I a few of the workshops that I've done, and, and this is how I kind of learned a little bit when it comes to playwriting is because when, as you mentioned, the, you said you were reading a lot of plays. I, you know, I was doing that with screenplays and because that's what everybody said, go read screenplays. All right. And I would read them. I'm like, okay, I don't know what I'm looking at. I, <laughs> I, I don't understand, you know, what, what to do now, you know? And so, and it wasn't until I was doing, uh, directing and doing playwriting workshop or festivals and stuff like that. And I had to read plays, but it was the bad ones that yeah. made me realize what made the good ones. Great. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. and so that when I, when I do my playwriting workshop for a high school th theater festival, I'll bring two, two plays um, that we did in, in play noir, the film, the uh, film noir style one act festival, a play that was submitted. That was just absolutely horrendous. And, and then I juxtapose that with a play that we, that we produced and, um, and just kind of like what good stage directions are and, and like the difference between showing and not telling. And a lot of the playwrights, you know, afterwards, you know, when I say that show, don't tell, then they'd be like, Oh, now I get it. You know? Um, and I would love to do that online workshop and just have it streaming. But unfortunately, I think if that playwright ever found out that I was using that play, then <laughs> things well, would I not go well. I learned writing my first screenplay. Um, I, I got my master's from Columbia, and then I had this idea that I should get a job I hate. It would force me to learn how to make a living writing. So I became a security guard. Oh. Did not tell them I had a master's from Columbia. They never would have hired me. But I was college educated. Well, within a, shoot, a few short months, I was made supervisor. So my plan wasn't working because I had more responsibility. But I found an ad in the Village Voice. They were looking for a screenwriter. So I read the script that I picked it up, and I had a play running at that time. And right next to the ad was my play. So they, they did meet with me. I had a good review. And I said, I read the script. I had no idea what I was doing. And I, I cut scenes. I cut a bunch. And then when they interviewed me, they said, why did you cut those scenes? And I said, because they weren't good. I mean, as a reader, they just weren't good. I got hired. I never wrote a screenplay. The first day I show up at the office, I write like, you know, until five o'clock, I handed my pages, 22 of them. They threw out 20. They kept oh. two. Yeah. So jumping ahead later, not long after, I, a producer, Bill Lustig, saw my play Rockaway Boulevard at the Actors Studio, and he said, you're the guy I need. I want to do a blue-collar death wish. And he hired me to write Vigilante. Once again, I had no idea how to write a screenplay. I didn't even know what interior, exterior, all that. But I sat with him, and after three or four days, he said, now go home and write what we talked about. And I bring in the script, and he said, wow, okay, it's working. 
where did you get that? Where did, what movie did you get that idea from? And I said, I just saw it in my head. And I learned that he paced the movie rhythmically and guided me for the film he wanted to make. He didn't have the ideas. He didn't, wasn't even sure about the characters. We had one or two. But we got that screenplay done that way. And I think that's the best way for a screenwriter to write is to work with a director who's already shot a film and knows. Now, a lot of the screenwriters are directors and they know what they want. He's one of the, fa you know, uh, he's, he was like one of those who didn't write, but he needed a writer who knew that world. And I came up with a metaphor that was called Vigilante. I wanted um, um, the good, the bad, the ugly, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if you see the film, and basically that's from Lord of the Flies. So my metaphor was there's evil, there's bad, and then there's good. And that's Vigilante. That took me through the structure of the film. Um, but that's how I learned writing a screenplay. And um, I, I still think they're the hardest things to do. Um, it, it's almost not natural to not to deal with language um, as much to, to write for the camera. The, it, it took me a long time, but I'm, I'm a visual person. Even my poetry is very visual. So screenwriting was a natural move, right. but I prefer collaborating with the director. I really prefer that. Well, you had mentioned, you know, you, uh, a couple of times that, you know, the, how, how, Screenwriting is so structured, which it is. Now, how do you approach your structure with, with your plays? Same thing, except okay. there are two acts. Yeah, there are okay. two acts instead of three. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's a good question. I thought about that about 20 years ago, why I had that structure. Um, I, I divide everything, even my novels almost, into two acts. You know, driving action, upward action, and then the second act explaining the classic structure. The hero has a fall or something comes up and boom. I love that. I, I mean, I need structure. I'm pretty good at it. It's really interesting at NYU. Um, when I got hired to teach writing, playwriting and screenwriting, my weakness was story and plot. So what did I teach? Story and plot. I figured the only way I'm going to learn is to teach. And that's what I tell people. You teach to learn. I was great at character. In my actor studio, I would like get accolades about my characters. But man, I had no idea structure. You know, I was just bad at it. Now I'm people come to me asking me. So my plays are two acts. You know, there it goes to an action and stops. Sometimes, actually, now, man, there's no intermission. I just write, you know, ninety minute plays straight. Sure. Yeah, straight. It's it's funny you say that because um, I've I've never been a big fan of the adage "those who can't teach." Yeah, no. those who can't do teach. Right. Which I. I'm not a fan of it because I, I I totally agree with what you said that you're when you're teaching, you're still learning, mm -hmm. you know, and you're just learning from a, a different uh, position, you know, um, you're right. I just said something in a class the other day and I stopped and I said, Hey, somebody write that down that I said, I never thought of that before about screenwriting. And I, I it was an interesting, and it's happened to me recently in the last year, Two things where all this time I've always taught, you know, lectured about screenwriting, and now I came up with two interesting thoughts that never occurred to me. It's we're interesting so doing it, you know. Yeah, it, it's interesting how you know when you are going back, like, I like, don't know what I'm looking for, I don't know what I'm doing when I read this, I don't know why it works. It's interesting as you continue this process of, of craft, when all of a sudden things just click. It just comes out of nowhere. All of a sudden things start making sense, you know. Um, I want to I want to talk about the, the, the structure real quick. So when you write when you're writing your two act structure, and, and I'm 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 gonna ask you because you you might be different than somebody else who writes in a two act. How what is your how does your first act end? Um, let me let me think usually, of it. is it structurally? Usually the the act the second act I mean the first act ends on a moment of danger for the lead something that will bring the audience back. Um, the danger doesn't have to be their life. Their danger has to be something they're trying to fulfill is not going to work out. And usually the second act begins with that person finding a new way or explores a new way to bring it to a uh, solution or a confrontation. Um, 
I'm trying to think of uh, all right, the Gwadar I wrote a few years ago. Um, Black and White City Blues. I, I, I brought a play to the studio that I wrote when I was in my 20s and read it at the studio. And I wanted to finish it. And the, the second act ends. He's a junkie in, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, 1971. And the play begins with his brother jumping off a roof thinking, because he's high and he thinks he could fly. He's doing speed balls. So my lead, little guy, um, is feeling so guilty about that. And then he stops shooting, tries to stay off the junk, and the the first act ends where he gets high again. And then the second act is he's high, and he's trying to fight it again, and he knows he has to leave his girlfriend, his ghost of his brother, his friends, everyone he's hanging out with if he's ever going to survive heroin. And so, you know, I'm using that as a as a bold example because it's extreme, but it's him trying to get off junk. So at the end of the first act, He's getting high again. And so you're not, and and you are not, your second act is not continually continuing where you left off at the end of the first. Um, is there a, no, I don't think so. I, I mean, think, there's a, there's a, like a, a shift in time, right? Like, you know, there's a jump yeah. in time, I should say. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's usually, I'm trying to think now on my plays. Um, so Guada, um, which we did, you know, there's no act. I, I, to me, is an act. But my plays now are running 90 minutes without a break. Uh, sure. when, you know, he did. The the director, the producer wanted an act because he said people need the bathroom. So that was kind of an arbitrary break, you know. But um, no, I I want the people to leave the act talking and come back sure. um, with with something. I mean, listen, we're in the entertainment business too. Um, you know, it's a weird thing we're in. We're in a, a literary world and an entertainment world. You know, like when I go to a play, I want to be entertained first off. And then I hope it's a play that makes me think about my life, sure. you know. And if I'm thinking about my life, then I really stay with it. And if I'm being just entertained, like what did I see? Um, a Gentleman's Guide to Murder comes to mind. I laughed through the whole thing, loved it. I did not think of my life at all. But boy, did I enjoy it. Um, lend me a tenor. I laugh through the whole damn thing. But I do prefer plays when I go see and think, wow, what would I do? How's my life like that? I mean, that's why I write. Right. I, listen, there are writers that do really well, make a lot of money. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they do it. I know they asked John Updike, why don't you write Valley of the Dolls? And he said, I would if I knew how. <laughs> you know, and, and it's not easy. We write what we're born to write. I sure. guess. You know, so, um, so my guess is like, you've got, you've come up with an idea and once yeah. you've got that idea, the, your next step is going back a little bit title, then metaphor or metaphor, then title. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Like I need a title that is the metaphor. It comes. Okay, so, to so how does that, how do you come up with that? What's that process? Well, um, for instance, my plays are Guada that I'm trying to get off Broadway here. That's was published a couple of years, 2019. Um, growing up in this neighborhood in Queens, every once in a while over the years, someone in that neighborhood was arrested by um, uh, the government for lying on their passport application when they came here after World War II. And it winds up that they were guards at concentration camps, at least five or six people over the years. And then when I'm at the studio a couple of years ago, I said, I want to write about this, but I don't know how to get into the story. Guess what? I pick up a local newspaper and a guy takes a shot at a journalist. He's arrested and his name comes up that he came here in 1946 and lied on his passport application that he was a guard at Buchenwald. And it went, damn, that's it. So I needed to create a, a, a story of a Homeland Security guard uh, so, I'm sorry, Homeland Security agent who wants to interview him. Uh, he's being held in this precinct in Queens. Did some research, blah, blah, blah. I wanted to know what the word nothing slash genocide was in Polish because he was Polish. And it's Zagwata. And I got my title, got my metaphor. And she interviews him because her mother and father survived Buchenwald and knew him. In fact, he was lovers with 
the mother. I don't want to spoil the play, but he's done sure. something. He's done something that drives her. So that's how that play came up. And boy, that was a tough play. I had four characters, one set, all in a police precinct and an interrogation room. And I struggled bringing pages into the actor's studio. I struggled because I had four stories to tell. The reporter was a black journalist who was writing about this and slavery, finding a comparison. And there was a, a, a cop named Napoli who said, why am I wasting my time on this 90 year old guy who's dying when I have real terrorists out there? And then I have the Homeland Security Guard, this woman who needs to punish him. You got to extradite him. We don't, we don't war crimes. We don't do that here. We have to find a country that would, tr- you know, bring him to trial. So she has only 48 hours to do that. So I have the ticking clock. I have the confrontation scenes. And it was it was a tough play to write um, structurally. And I got it. I, you know, I got it. And when we did that production in North Carolina, I said, wow, this works. Terrific director, Gary Smith, really did a great job. The set was great. And here we are, like in Banner Elk in the mountains, you know. And uh, people really, really liked it. So now I'm trying to get it here in New York. Wow. A lot so, of research. A lot of research. Sure, I would imagine so. So you've got your title, you've got your, your metaphor, and what's the next step? Um, then I write what the character wants. She wants to, she knows who he is, because he's come up on their Homeland Security thing. So she now needs to get him to confess or get a country that will take him. So her interrogation of him, and the obstacles are the NYPD cop that is there for New York City Homeland Security of uh, NYPD doesn't want to waste his time, but she is in control. But he tries to get her um, recused because this is a personal thing. And then there's the um, the, re- the the reporter who feels that um, this man is not guilty of what he did. That he was he was forced to be a guard. He was 17 years old, mm. and so I'm dealing with ethical, moral issues, cultural issues. And the Holocaust, and the only reason I say it's not a Holocaust play, but what I want to deal with is the awareness that is not out there, you know, um, about these, uh, about law crimes in general. As Americans, like, we're really, really spoiled. You know, we really are. And, you know, um, and I have a play called Aleppo, which is a social, uh, it's a parody, a satire about a guy, typical American attorney in the, you know, in the Midwest wakes up one day and he has a rare disease called Aleppo and he goes to the doctor and the doctor says, sorry, you got it. And it's terminal. And he has no idea what it is. He goes into a coma and guess what? He wakes up in the city of Aleppo having no idea why he's there. And I get to then write about America's indifference to the world outside their own little world. Mm -hmm. Um, Not not that we don't have problems here, but that we have no interest in what goes on outside our life. And that was called Aleppo. That was the metaphor. Um, It's a disease. A civil war is going on in his body, and he winds up in Aleppo. Uh, I don't know how I got that idea either. I think the thing about... You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of that episode of Twilight Zone. Well, it's every the, the, the bigot, the bigot who wakes up and all of a sudden he's in all these different. Yes. Uh, yeah, he he's a he's a in a, a form of, of each you know race that he's always uh, been a bigot against. Yes, and the thing is, like at the Writers Guild, we voted on the the, the best series TV series ever. I don't know why the, uh, Twilight Zone doesn't win all the time. It's one of the most influential, if not the most influential, TV series. I will go I back. All the time, uh, yeah. le- at least a couple times a year, I'm always going back and rewatching certain episodes. Yeah, Rod Serling, and it's funny about Rod Serling, a side thing, he really wanted to be a playwright, you yeah. know, and he took a summer off because he loved O'Neill and he wanted to write a play. Halfway through the summer, he quit because he said, I can't write a play. You know, it's, it's like we're, we have skills for certain things, and you know, and our job is to develop those skills. It, and it's a lot of cultivation. Like Baudelaire says, artists should lie on a hill, look up at the sky, and cultivate their sensibilities. Yes, it's what I've done most of my life, whether it's like walking, swimming, running, thinking. When I'm not, you know, like when an idea hits me, I start to think about it. You can call it ruminate, whatever. But we need to do that as artists. 
you know, uh, as writers, we got to, how does, where do the ideas come from? People tell me, my students, I say, I read everything. I think about everything. And there are some things I personally want to find out about, like in my neighborhood with these people getting arrested. I have no idea what that was about. It took me 30 years to come up with a story. Sure. I mean, you know, I tell people, hey, it takes years. And also another funny anecdote, Romeo, uh, Shakespeare was writing Romeo and Juliet, right? And he writes to Ben Spencer, I'm having a big problem. My character, Mercutio, is stealing the play from my lead. And then he wrote Ben, ben Spencer back two weeks later. I solved the problem. I killed Mercutio. And <laughs> I tell my students, listen, nothing's perfect. Even Romeo and Juliet, which might be the one play that is in everybody's brain, everybody's brain, forget about Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, we know everywhere. Even the author had a hard time making it perfect. Because if you read the play, Mercutio, Mercutio is so interesting. Her, him and Juliet are the most interesting people in the play. You said Ben Spencer? Yeah, Ben Spencer, yeah, the playwright. Is that – I'm not familiar with him. That, that's because, you know – Probably didn't come across him much in in my in my <laughs> education. But the the and this is I'm total total different tangent. I'm just curious. Uh, is that is that letter ever? I mean, is it documented? If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously it is because it's you know. But it, does does a copy exist or anything like that, or is this just a story that's carried over? No, I think I have read it. Believe it or not, in Harold Bloom's book um, Shakespeare: The Invention of the Mind. And the the reason why I'm asking is like. If you, I'm wondering if that letter is like, it should be like evidence of his existence. You know, there's always that, oh, well, you know, there was no William Shakespeare. He didn't exist. He did. It was this person who actually was writing those plays, you know, or, yeah. It's such an insult to Shakespeare, you know. Yeah, um, yeah the guy was around. Um, but I didn't even think of that. I was just thinking that I, I try to get to my students the fact, don't, you know, what is that? Perfection is the is the evil of good. No, what is that saying? They always want to be perfect. Is the right. enemy good? Yeah. Just so just write something good. Why do you think that? What do you think gets in in playwrights' ways? Why do you think we? What, what's that one thing that you think gets in our way when it prevents us from from writing? The writing or, itself, or a play, being a playwright. You know what? What's what gets oh, in our way? I, I'm pretty sure that. You should not attempt to play unless you have a feeling for language. You know, I've, I've tried to teach writers um, play playwriting. Playwriting is the hardest because if if the student has a feeling for language, it's amazing. Even if they're floating around with story and plot, but if they what, don't, what does that mean? An ear for language. Keep going. Expand on that a little bit more. Unpack that for me. I'm not quite well, sure. The same way when you're writing a screenplay that you better have a visual sense, let the camera tell the story. Like I tell them really basically screenplays are scenes connected to scenes connected to scenes. Theater is all about language. I mean, you know, and, and I got to tell you, I don't hear a lot of language that much anymore. And I have my own theories about that since I've been around a while. I think TV writing has totally affected theater, you know, um, where – the mundane uh, is not as interesting. You know, it, it's it's kind of been integrated into the theater. Language, I mean, you don't read Tennessee Williams, read Arthur Miller. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll use Mammon as an example of one extreme. Look at the language. Um, look, look, look uh, once again, a raisin in the sun. What great language. You know, forget about the conflict, the character. That's all great stuff. But the language, I love to hear. To me, it's music. At least for me, it's musical. The language of a damn good playwright, I just sit there and listen. Another thing, too, is I see the words. Even when, you know, this is a weird thing, but when I go to the theater, I could stand in the back of the theater and listen and see the words that the actors are speaking of my own play or whatever play. I don't really need to see it happening, but I see words. I see, and I hear language as music. At least for me, it's music. Sam Shepard, look at his music in Sam Shepard. Jeez, you know? Um, and I love like, you know, uh, John's, uh, play, uh, doubt the music, you know, the music and the language of those characters. Um, that, that is what I mean by language. And you can't teach that, you know, you, you, it's, it's, it's really tough. You could sure. teach plot, but you can't teach language. 
Well, that's, that's, that's what scares me even because I don't, I don't think that I've have that mastery at all, you know, and, and, but I still think I have some, some halfway decent stories I'll get out. And I just, you know, it's like, I worry that, you know, that people th- would walk away from it if, if they feel that they don't, and maybe they do. Maybe I do. I, and just don't realize, I don't know. I just, I don't well, know if that that's a fear of mine. Well, different sto- things, stories hit me different ways. Like I'm doing a collection of short stories. None of them would make good plays because they're not about language. They're about a narrative. They're about, um, they're about, all right, like I just finished one called The Ballad of the Hot Dog Man. When I was growing up, there was a hot dog guy in the corner and he was there, right, from 1950 until he died in 2021. Wow. He was 90 something. And I was always fascinated with this guy. He never left the corner. Do you know something? He owned everything you could see from his hot dog stand. He bought up all the real estate. And for years, I've been thinking about this guy. How do I know about him? Because I went back to a uh, grammar school reunion. We the, One of the first things we talked about was the hot dog guy. He was a Polish immigrant who started selling hot dogs on that corner. And when he died, he owned Chase Manhattan Bank. He owed uh, the laundromat, T-Mobile, all those stores, all those stores were in property he owned. And he still sold hot dogs. I had to write about that. But it didn't work as a play because he hardly speaks in the the short story. It's Mm. 8,000 words. It wouldn't work as a play. Maybe could work as a short film. But I had to write it as a short story. And so that is another thing. Like you – Maybe some stories you have to you, you want to tell are not plays. They may be films. They may be novels. They may be fiction. Um, sometimes it's poetry. So that's one of the stories that I'm working on, and I know was not a play. What launched you in from po- from from going starting with poetry and then going into playwriting? What was that shift? Well, that was interesting because I am still trying to figure out what came first. Oh. Um, there was a girl in grammar school who I sat next to, had a huge crush on, and I wrote her a love letter. I was 13. She said, thank you very much, but I have a boyfriend. He's in Vietnam. So he had to be at least 17. She was 13. The next day, she brings in a poem that he wrote while in Nam. And I went, why do you want me to read this? You should read it, she said. I went home and read, re- read it. And then wrote a poem, which I have hanging on the wall somewhere. I brought it in. She gave read it. She gave it to the nun. The nun read it, said, I want you to go to every class in the school and read this poem. And the poem was about a next-door neighbor who got hit by a mortar on Normandy Beach, my, fa- my, fr- my, my best friend at the time's father. So I became known as the poet. And from that day on, I would, like, stand on my stoop and look at the sky and write a poem about the sunset. Somewhere in there, I decided after watching movies, not plays, because my family did not go to the theater, that I was going to put a theater in my backyard. So I put up chairs. I got my brothers and my friends, and I wrote scripts. They were always about detectives and gangsters. And I'd give them the scripts, try to direct them, and we put on plays. I'd charge a nickel, 10 cents for the seats in front. And I had to be about 13. So they both came about the same time, but it wasn't until I was in Columbia and I took a class and we read, um, oh, John Gwert's play that's set in Queens, I forgot. And I heard the language of the play and I said, wow, that sounds like poetry. And then I started to um, write a play. And actually I was supposed to, I was working on my master's essay about Delmore Schwartz and James Agee, and I was supposed to be working on that, but instead I started writing my first play, raised the money and put it on in a theater that doesn't exist anymore, the 19 play, 19th Street Playhouse. And I got a great review in the Village Voice, except they said that there's no story, there's no plot. <laughs> the play's about nothing, and it's fascinating. <laughs> so, but, so I was doing plays and poetry at the same time. Movies were... I remember going to my father and I said, you know, I love movies. I don't know why I don't write them. And then I actually, I got hired to write Vigilante. Novels, well, I loved Dickens when I was at Columbia and Melville. So I started reading novels. Once again, I tell my students, read, because reading inspired me to write. 
you know. Sure. Do you still have some of those plays from when you were 13? Do they, uh, do they yeah. exist in a box somewhere? No, no. I'm very fortunate. The Frank Melville Library at Stony Brook University created their Richard Viteri archives in 2005. So I kept 50-something boxes full of letters, everything. And one day I had them in my mother's house, not my place. And one day I got a letter. We were coming to collect them. And boy, was my mother thrilled. And they took 52 boxes. But that only went up to 2005. Since 2005, I do send them stuff. But now it's, what, another 15 more years. And I got more stuff. I have the Marriage Fool teleplay that I, was a play. And I sold it to, uh, it's running on Amazon now, streaming on Amazon. Walter Matthau, Carol Burnett, they signed the script. Then I got the third miracle, Ed Harris, and Hesh signed the script. So Coppola signed the script. So I have those here. I got to find another place to donate because I think they're our cut. They're our cut. My archives are packed over there. But they airbrush, they airbrush, they, they air purify all the paper. And now, you know, we got a lot more digital stuff. So, sure. yes, to answer your question, it's saved. And I got to find some more room for these. I do send stuff to them and they're really good. They take it, you know? Uh, yeah. Is, is that early stuff when you were doing the backyard theater? Was, was it good? Uh, yeah. No, go, everything. Or do you go back like, Oh my God, what was I thinking? I've come such a long way or, or did like, it was really happy. Oh, yeah, no, no, it, it, listen, I look back just a couple of years and go, what was I thinking? You know, like well, black and white city blues. I wrote in my twenties and Maya who directed it, said, you could tell it's a young writer. I rewrote the whole play because I here's what I did. I overwrote. Sure. Oh, my God, did I overwrite. I never got to a point, like make a point. I had a lot of stage directions. I love the play now. I, you know, the older Viteri rewrote the young Viteri. I didn't want to lose a lot of the youthful exuberance of the young Viteri, but the mature Viteri um, gave it a lot more structure. I didn't change the beginning at all, the opening 20 pages, and I didn't change the last 10. But the middle I had to rewrite. It's interesting that this, a, this is an ongoing theme that comes up in the last few episodes where a lot of playwrights are criticizing their older work. And it's like, well, you're not the same playwright. I, I think it's a really unfair position. Their older work or their younger work are they criticizing? Their, young, their younger work, the stuff that oh. they started out with. It's like, oh, you know, it's like I don't know what I was saying. And I'm like, no, of course you, you're different now. Right. You're a totally different playwright. You shouldn't, you can't criticize what you were writing then because you, you know, it's like it's the whole hindsight 2020. Of course, you're. It's it's not going to be the same as what you're writing now. You know, well, you, you've grown. Hopefully, you've grown. Hopefully, you're not writing the same way and the same stuff that you were 20 years ago. Well, I so. did the third miracle, which is published by Simon and Schuster, is the novel. I like it a lot. The movie, you know, Agnieszka Holland directed it. Brilliant director. I like the movie. I might like the, you know, I love Ed Harris. I, I like might like the novel more than a movie. But then I did a stage adaptation, which I love. I love the stage adaptation. I've never done it. I've done readings of it. So why? Because I actually answered some things that I think. I might have over, not overlooked, but as we get older, a philosophy of the world might change or maybe the technique, my technique got better. I, when I don't like something is like, I could see the technique and it, it's not as good. The craft is not as good. I'm really much, much better now. Sure, but all right, I'm sorry, remind me, it was, uh, the, the play was Black and White City Blues, is that what it was? Yeah, Black and White City Blues, yeah. Okay, so. It, and you said it was it was overwritten, right? Yes. But you but what, was this a piece that was published? No, no, no. I did it uh, at the studio in 1978, 79. Okay. And someone told me there was a production at the ATA Theater in the early 80s. I kind of remember. Kind of. Okay, but it, so it was published or was not published that that original Never version? Published. Never published. Okay. No. So I was going to say if it was overwritten, it was still good enough to be, to be published, or you know, or at least it sounds like somebody it was good enough for somebody to perform. Hey, listen, I've rewritten published plays. My play Gangster Peril, when someone wants to do it, I, I say get the rights, but I'm sending you my draft that I like better. Um, Caravaggio, I love the play, the rewritten version, not the published. And I love the screenplay adaptation. It won the Beverly Hills 
international. Um, I won the Golden Palm in 2021 for the best screenplay at the Beverly Hills uh, um, Playhouse. Yeah, fil film festival. Yeah. Okay. For the screenplay. Yeah. So, it's and I love the screenplay more than the play. It's interesting you say that because there's a lot of there's a few playwrights that I've talked to that are like you know oh it's it's published and I can't go back and make changes but yet here we have you and you're saying yeah here we go yeah absolutely I, you can't you yeah know. you can learn things from, you sure. know the play got published and you know and then and then like I found something different that I wanted to bring in I didn't change the structure Gangster Apparel is still a two character play but boy and then I sold it to Paramount. And I, the screenplay is good, but I prefer the play. But I prefer my draft of the play, which I rewrote about 10 years ago. Um, the Marriage Fool I sold to CBS. I really love the play, but people love the movie because I was able to do things in the movie I couldn't do in the play. Sure. But I have to lose some things in the play. Would I rewrite the play? I, I, you know, someone's doing a reading of it uh, in this month, and I'm going to go up and see it. Uh, I want to see the the play. I love the play, but I love the. How could you not like Carol Burnett and Walter Matthau? By sure. the way, John Stamos. Yeah. Um, when when that happens, when when you somebody asks for the rights to to the that a particular play that you you written a new draft of, and they say, yeah, you can do it, get the rights, and then I'll send you this new one. Do you ever? Does anybody ever come back and say, no, nah, I like the original better? Uh, that's a really good question. And no. <laughs> No one's okay. done that yet. You know? Okay, so they're but, happy to take the new the new draft and, and 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 produce that. Yeah, I'll be prepared though, just in case that happens. I, sure. I have to come up with an answer. <laughs> sure, I, I'm just curious, you know, how much it's changed, or you know, what uh, in in between those drafts, or you know, if it's just more updated, or if it's just, you know. So. Well, I learned, you know, in Gangster Peril, they they it was they're supposed to do a hit. They get arrested. One of them wants to rat out the boss and Rikers. That stuff hasn't changed. But then they become cowboys in Yuma, Arizona, witness protection. And um, I did a lot of research. After, while the production was running, someone came up to me and said, you know, did you know this about Yuma? And I went, wow, I didn't know that. I had to change the women's names. They're not in the play, but referred to. There was so much funnier, so much more funnier. Things about Yuma I didn't know. You know, so when people ask for the play, I said, do that. And someone did a reading of it like two years ago with the original draft, not the original, my draft. Um, sure. I just saw it. I didn't go up and see it. Um, but I'm so busy trying to get, I have like five new plays that have not been produced. Five. You know, I write a play a year at the PDW and at the studio. And, you know, I'm trying to find invest producers. I just had lunch with a producer. I wrote a play about Joe McCarthy. And his battle with Lester Hunt, uh, the senator of Wyoming. Um, and I had a theater in Wyoming that was writing to me. But then they never decided to even do a reading. So I, mm. she's from Wyoming and she has money. So I had a talk with her. And we're going to have another lunch on where to bring the play. I have a play about a famous atheist I've been working on for years. It was actually done in L.A., an early draft. And they loved it, but they said it wasn't done, and they were right. Um, I have Aleppo and the Black and White City Blues and a, a play called Thornwood, a two-character play for women, one in her 50s, one in her 60s. And, boy, is it tough to get uh, – I've done readings. You know, people always want to do readings, um, but people say it's painful play. So, we're, you know, we're, it's an odd time. Sure. Well, you earlier you said when we first started, you you said I think you for it nobody wants to produce commercially, and I wanted to I wanted to go back to that because I want to know exactly what that means when it well, when you refer to it as commercially. Yes, I needed to find out too. In other words, if you're a non for profit, people don't invest in the play; they donate their money. There's no investment; they don't get their money back. Uh, commercial theater is they try to get their money back. So I'm not going to mention names, but I had theater commercial theater producers, meaning commercial, non, not-for-profit, who said, I'm not doing off-Broadway theater anymore. There's no money in it, and I can't get an audience. And, you know, there is Broadway, and then there's off-Broadway, and then there's maybe off-off-Broadway. So that off-Broadway thing, which I always loved, I've had a bunch of plays produced off-Broadway, is really not as, not ha and not healthy. 
you know, you have your non for profits, they're not producing as much anymore either. A lot of theaters are closing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um you also you also mentioned equity earlier. Mm -hmm. Do you always do you always produce equity? No, 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 no. I as a playwright, I'm just happy if I have good actors. Um if it's um if they could afford equity, that's great. I want to see everybody paid. And if they can't, they sh should still get paid something. Sure. You know, um, I'm a Writers Guild lifetime member, so I'm totally a union. And um, but equity is tough. You know, it's a lot of I'm very, very few actors are happy with and I'm talking about stars I know. No mm -hmm. one's happy with their unions ever. I'm happy with the Writers Guild big time, but a lot of them are not happy with actors unions for some reason um and equity you know equity is looking to protect their members which is their job um but there's mm -hmm. no way to finance theater how, how do you get plays done when the nut is so high the tickets are crazy aren't tickets nuts no, 100. I mean, well, that's that's the whole thing, and that's why that's why I kind of gave that reaction when you said the, that they're out there to to protect their members because when it came to, and I don't think New York went through this, we had the 99 seat waiver here in LA. I remember you that. Know, and they put it to a vote. The actors said no. The guild equity said, "Too bad, we're going to do it anyway." Oh, okay. Well, and so they, they, they got rid of the equity waiver. They, they expected that, um, that all the, all the actors should be paid minimum wage through rehearsal, through performance, you know, and I, I did, uh, I did one equity production when I was producing, and this was before, before this whole thing. And the one thing with equity as well is that when you use one equity performer, anybody that's in any of the sister unions, has to be paid as well. And this is just when it was like a, a uh, I think it was a $9 stipend or something like that performance. Not that, no big deal. Right. But now when you, now when you've ad added, a, if you've got a cast of 12 or 14, and if any of those were in uh, AGVA uh, or, um, or, or SAG or AFRA, because I don't think they had joined yet. No. Now you've just, you've, 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 exponentially increased your you know and now now that's it now we're not dealing with a stipend now we're dealing with minimum wage now my production of play noir that cost me five thousand dollars because I, I can't afford to pay my actors not that i don't want to but now i'm being forced to and if all of them are in any of the other unions because i have to pay them too it's part of the equity now i'm my i'm going up to you know twenty twenty five thousand dollars nobody's going to come and see it uh a series of one act plays for $50 a night, you know? And so I, I don't know if they finally got rid of that or not. Uh, and they, and, and they finally backtracked, but I, I don't know. I just, that's why I, I can't produce, I can't produce equity theater. It's just too expensive and you're increasing your cost. you know, well, you, you know, just, ten, tenfold sometimes. You just explained exactly what I was hearing from New York commercial theaters one of the theater owners was actually going to give up his theater. It's a beautiful theater. And he said, I can't run it anymore. Luckily for him, there's a resurgence in children's theater, a big thing. And they came and they rented his theater for a year, not every night of the week. So he can still do readings. But um, this is the problem with theater. And I, I don't know. It's a come, you know, it's the perfect storm. There's so many articles written about the, non-for-profit theater companies that are closing because of mismanagement sure. you know where the artistic director was taking a ton of money home but how about developing american plays um mm -hmm. i think this country has always needed a theater like a government theater you know where it, it listen we could fund everything <laughs> why don't we fund the arts and and sure. the theater? You know, like put someone, a Joe Papp, whoever you like, in charge and say, put this out there to all the major cities and some rural places and put theaters in there. Do children's theater. Do this. You got actors. That's not the problem. And you got playwrights. So, well, you know, 
I'll, I'll say that I think the problem is, honestly, because when you say rural, I think the issue is the cities. I mm-hmm. think if you go rural, because it's not as expensive there. Oh, yeah. And let like, me tell you, I've had plays on in Wisconsin where these motorcycle guys came up. I had a, a play called No More Riders, and they loved it. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was a rebellious play, and they go, I really dig it, man. That was good. Yeah, I mean, there's room for theater is terrific. It's There's room for every place. Um, and, you know, it, it, little theaters, but they need money. You know, you do want to pay people. Sure. No, 100%. But what I'm saying is like it's those smaller markets that actually people actually support. You know, yeah. a friend of mine uh, went, he, he bought a place in, in Lake Arrowhead, and there was a little theater there, and everybody came because it was like, and even explained, it's like, yeah, it's like George and Martha. It's like, hey, what are we going to do tonight? Well, let's go to the theater. You know, so there's when there's when it's not a busy city that has so much going on, when it's a s- smaller town or in the suburbs where things close early, it's like, well, let's go see a show because there's nothing else going on tonight. You and know? that's why, you know, theater should not be left to non for profits. It's a visceral communal thing that you can't get in a movie. I mean, you can't. And, you know, it's it's live and it's something that is um, it, listen, it's ancient. You know, it goes back. And it, those are the heroes to me, the people that run the theaters. Every time I meet someone who's running a theater, I said, hey, man, I know it ain't easy. Thank for you. Thank God for you. You know. Um, Do you think that general, generationally theaters doomed? And what I mean by that is because when you look at the theater, you're, it's, it's the blue hairs that are going. Oh, and, yeah. and I worry that maybe the younger crowds, I don't know, you, you did mention earlier that, that the younger audiences are starting to get come around to it. So, so maybe, I, maybe, I'm, I'm, maybe there's not a danger, but I don't know. I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Like when, when, that, when that generation starts to pass, is there going to be a, you know. The tradition. Um, once again, I, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. When I started, there was a lot more theater. Um, there were heroes in the theater. The off off Broadway, you know, people were heroes. Um, two things it's got going for it: actors. I don't know what it is, but everybody wants to act. Um, and then you know, you separate that. Then there's the really good ones. But everybody loves acting. I think it's great. I think it, it changed my life acting. Um, and I think everybody should take an acting class in their lifetime somewhere. That is something I think people should do: take an acting class. So actors will keep the theater alive. Film is a little harder. You got you need money. You sure. need a camera. Yeah, I know you could shoot it on your phone, but where do you get people to see it? So if you can get a space and you have actors, um, the other thing is people need to write plays. Think about it. There are people still taking playwriting classes on something that the Greeks did two thousand years ago. Right. Kind of strange. What it is about the visceral need to write a play that is performed live. You know, it was funny. My mother, when she saw my movies, thought the actors made the lines up. She didn't realize that was my job. And I still think when I go to a play and I say to myself, how the heck did these actors memorize these lines and make them so real? Now when I do it, I go, Jesus, I go to another place when I'm in a play. Sure. And there's something very human that we don't examine enough no one does on that need to portray ourselves um, in a performance, ourselves, humanity, in ourselves, um, that excites us and informs us, informs us. And I love doing it because, like Camus said, to him, actors were the real heroes because they got to play many lives. And there is something about that, you know? There is something about that, um, this is why I think theater will still be here no matter where it's done, you know, but it just needs somebody. So hopefully some younger people will get really smart and figure out how it could work with everybody. Like maybe everyone takes a cut at the box office or something. So the producer can at least survive the production to produce another day. Or they just start doing theater in their backyard. Yeah. Like I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So with, with your, I'm, I'm curious about this with your success in film and television, 
and that's where the money is to survive. Why do you keep going back to playwriting? Um, and, well, that's a really good question because I get to write the stories I want to write. I mean, it's really simple. You know, I get to write the stories I want to write. Um, when I was writing for ABC out in L.A., my agents wanted me to stay out there. And I felt like, I don't know. I don't want to write for someone else. I don't want to spend my, I didn't want to give my creativity to somebody else's ideas for a paycheck. I made money, you know. Um, and when it, since I came back, five published plays, five published novels, you know, I've written a lot since I've come back, um, without any uh, intrusion of concern, um, that I had to please someone. Yes. I'm always chasing, looking for publishers. Yes. I'm, but I'm knock on wood. I'm comfortable doing what I'm doing. You know, um, I'm 71 and you know, I'm still doing the same things I did at 35 with less economic concerns, maybe. Um, if Would I do a movie or uh, tomorrow? Absolutely. But I think I would prefer to act in it um, unless I can meet a director that I could write. The nice, and you know, the fun part about acting is I don't have to worry about anything. You know, um, I'm, I'm in the movie and they really treat you well. You're right. comfortable. You know, memorize your lines, and I get to do things I don't do in my real life. You know, and that's what. And then, yeah, you could do that in writing, but come on, it's not the same thing of actually doing it. You right. know what I mean? Like in the sh short film I had shot before the uh, thing, I was dying. I, I had brain cancer, my character, and I was I, in a wheelchair. I'd never been in a wheelchair, and um, I was like, okay, this sounds interesting, and I'm, I was having great fun as a character who's dying. And it has this kind of sense of humor. And I was in a wheelchair, which I was never been in. And, you know, they had, the makeup is, like, so depressing. But sure. it was fun, you know. And then I'm in something on cable right now. I acted, and I played a gangster, which was really fun. And they let me improvise because the script wasn't that good. But it's running. And I got to play this kind of, not like a, a suit and tie gangster, <clears throat> but he's a guy who comes up with this um, big, big, famous, um, he's the one. He was left out of the big movie. It's called the, the Great American Heist. And um, that was fun. You know, three camera shoot. So they picked up everything I was doing, which is kind of fun. Um, I do feel bad for real actors. And I, what I mean is people doing it as a career. It's hard, man. Yep. It's really difficult to survive, let alone act. You know, the acting is the least of it. Um, I don't know where the industry is going, and it, I think these schools are not the best things for it, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. Once you start, like, you remember, like, in the Great Depression, I think it was uh, Kennedy. Joseph Kennedy took his money out of all the stocks because his valet or driver said to him, oh, he's got a whole bunch of stocks. And then he realized if he's got it, I'm getting out. And he and his fortune remained intact. Well, now everybody's an actor. You know, everybody wants to act. Uh, I have friends that are like retired and they're going, I think I'm going to be an actor. I said, go ahead. Start going to acting class, memorize lines, start using your body, but stuff you are not ready to do. So right. sure. I think, I, how many members in SAG? 160,000, I think. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Writers Guild, 4,000. Think about it. 4,000. So it's hard to be a TV writer, film writer. It's hard. It's tough stuff. And um, and people think acting is easy. It ain't. It ain't easy. You know, and there's too many schools teaching, telling these kids you can do it. I'm going to get in trouble when I say this, but I tell a lot of students, I know they all want to be artists because they don't want to get a real job. Guess what? Being an artist is a real job. Yeah. It is hard. Well, no, I'm going to, I'll agree. I'll piggyback on that. Um, you know, there's some there I'm, you know, I'm in LA and there's, there's some film schools out here that I'm like, if you have the money, they'll, they'll be happy to take it, you know? And, and like, you know, NIFA is a fine example, New York film Academy here, at least, I don't know how it is in New York, but here it's a racket because, you know, they'll, they'll take your money. You have access to universal, but, any place that's gonna, and it's a lot of international students, you know, because they get to come to Hollywood, they get to, you know, work on the lot and whatnot. 
I don't know. I don't think the stuff's that, that good quality. And I don't really trust a film school where I can go over and teach <laughs> for 35 bucks an hour. You know, that, that I just, I don't know. It's, it's not that I don't have knowledge, but I just, you know, I, I guess it's um, the old Groucho Marx thing about the, the old, uh, I don't want to be a part of any country club where I can be a member. Right. You know, so it's just like, uh, I don't know. So, you know, so it's like I've I and I think because I don't feel like I have the, the, the film or television credits to be able to to justify me being there to teach. And I think that and I think that because I have friends or I know people who have taught there where it's just like. I'm not quite sure that you have the credits to justify teaching as well, but, you know, they hired you. So, yeah. 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 It's, so it's I two things. Yeah. When I teach, it's two things. It's sharing anecdotes because that's a lot of the questions, a lot of questions. Um, for instance, I know when I was writing in L.A. for ABC, I was born into the office because I had a tan. I looked <laughs> like I spent my days in the sun. Well, on right. weekends, I swam. I had a pool. Sure. Where I was and I got brought in because I had a tan. I shared that with my students. Oh my God, they had no idea. They didn't. They thought that it was because I would look like a brown person that I was being prejudiced against. I said, "No, right. you don't understand." They were upset that I wasn't suffering. They're paying me seven days a week, and they want you to suffer. So that was a fun thing. I and then I try to teach craft. Craft is really the the essential. You know, when you get hired to write a TV show, you got to come up with ideas, man. You got to write fast. You got to know where those. I mean, I was so impressed with in the writers' room with these professional screen uh, TV writers how they broke the four act structure down. This would happen in Act Two, and I go, I don't even know what the, how did you get there. This will happen at the end of Act, you know, middle of Act One. This is at the end of, the, and I was just so impressed with their idea of structure, their, their 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 DNA. It was in their DNA structure, very different from in the theater, you know. Sure. Very different from fiction writing. The nice thing about writing novels is I get away with a lot of stuff I can't get away with in theater. I don't have a two-hour minimum time to tell a story. A person can read my book, put it down, and then pick it up later. You know, sure. Um, but I get to tell stories that don't have to be. You know, they have to. You know, they got to have the ticking clock. They got to have structure. But I get a lot more time to share what I want to share, and um, so all those things are craft. You know, we don't talk about craft enough. Um, so that's why, you know, yeah, I want to, I check when I write letters of recommendation and I have a student want to go somewhere, I check the faculty before I even say that's a good school. And some of the faculties are impressive. They got great credits. Good. They want to share what they learn. Excellent. What, uh, we, I know you've already gone, you've gone through the list of the five plays that you're, you're, you've kind of putting up right now. Is there any, is there anything else that you're working on? Uh, yeah, I'm right. I'm, I'm most immediately. I am writing the collection of short stories. Okay. Um, they're ballads. I'm calling it ballads. It's the ballad of the poison heart. That's ten thousand words. I'm, I did three drafts. The ballad of the hot dog man. Right. And the ballad of the young poet. I figure I need about fifty thousand words before I put the collection and send it to publishers. Um, working on that. I'm working on adapting my own novel, The Writer's Afterlife. Um, at the actor's studio into a stage play. Okay. That is a toughie, a toughie. You know, when you're adapting a novel as a movie, it's easy. Adapting it as a stage play, you know, it's a monologue. The whole play is a monologue. And, you know, the questions you ask in the theater is like, who's he talking to? Well, when I wrote the novel, and it's published, and it got great reviews in Publishers Weekly, I didn't ask that question, who's he talking to? He's talking to the reader, you know? Right, sure. So I had to, um, and I gave dialogue from one character, very important dialogue, to another character that, you know, I didn't do that in, in the book because it becomes like a huge monologue, which is not what I want to do. So I'm adapting that right now. And, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's the main stuff I'm writing at the moment. A lot of sending stuff out, trying to raise this up. Uh, get. We're looking at off-Broadway theaters now and getting them to, I don't know how these people... We're offering money and a play and a star, and they are so difficult to wake up. You know, it's like, make a decision. 
your, your theaters, you know, I, I don't hear really good things about how financially stable a lot of theaters are in theater companies. When you say you're offering money, are you offering to fund it? Yeah, yeah. We, we've come up with um, donations of, um, um, for the play, Zaguara. Um, people that really love it. If you can't invest, remember, you can't go off Broadway commercially. These are non for profit. Right. So why not just in, uh, produce it yourself? We, we like to be with um, a theater that has a subscription list. And Fair enough. Sure. Yeah. Okay. That makes and sense. We, yeah. I've worked in some of these theaters myself as a playwright. So right. we'll go into them. But it's just so funny that you would think <laughs> that they would be fine um, because right. who's selling tickets? I don't know. Though, you know, plays get done. So, you know, they, they get done. Um, I'm trying to think what else I'm working on. I think I'm acting in something too, but I got to wait until the, I think I'm hopefully the strike will be over soon. Yeah, um, that's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. They're meeting this weekend again. Um, and I'm thinking about adapting another play of mine into a novel. Um, that's down the line. Oh, and I've written, you know, my memoir was published, live fast, die young, leave a good looking corpse was published <laughs> in 2021. And, um, can I hold it up? Yes, of course, please. This is me, James, 1971. Look at that. Look at that. Wait, I can't get the cat. What's wrong with me? You're it, a little it, or, there you go. Oh, 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 there you go. That's good, right? Right. Yep. Yep. Look, there you go. It's a memoir of the 70s and wow. um, published by. Uh, Amazing books. So I'm writing a sequel, Live Fast, Die Young, Leave a Good-Looking Corpse. And um, it's going to be the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I'm, I'm so I'm writing my memoir. It's really weird when you're writing a memoir. Do you know where that, what movie that line is from? I don't. It was from a novel um, originally and made into a movie. It's told by um, uh, an actor to Humphrey Bogart. Oh. Who, on his, and he's... He's just shot a cop, and he's going to get the electric chair. And his line to him is, live fast, die young, leave a good-looking corpse. And it was written, the book was written by an African-American writer and about an Italian-American family, and he got in trouble for writing about an Italian-American family. Would you believe it? In the 50s. Uh, imagine that in, the, in 2023. I know. And so it was made into the movie called uh, Knock on Any Door. I got to see it. If it's got Bogart yeah. in it, I got to see it. Yep. It was just on TCM a couple of uh, weeks ago, actually. Um, the actor was this good looking guy, very famous. His wife was in the movie 10. Remember 10? Yes. That was that was that Bo Derek and, right. and Dudley Moore. Yes. John Derek was her husband. Okay. He was a really good looking guy. He played. Um, Gross, uh, Johnny Johnny Romano. That's it. He played Johnny Romano. Live fast, die young, leave a good looking corpse. That's Nobody awesome. knows where that's from, but I. So I used it as the title of my memoir. Clearly, okay. I did not follow that. But it's okay. well, I just find it hard to leave a good looking corpse if you're getting electrocuted. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and then, uh, where can people find your work? Because it sounds like it's all over. But yeah, um, my new novel. Just came out. I'm not going to hold any more up. Um, She's Not There just came out, and I'm finding it all over Barnes & Noble, uh, Amazon, um, and it's now on a French site, a German site, and a Spanish site, which is interesting. And, um, you know, my plays are all over. Zaguada, I will hide. I'm, this is Zaguada. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And that's what DP dramatic publishing and okay. um, yeah, my stuff's all over the place. Uh, I'm amazed when I go online and I go, Oh my God, all this stuff out here. Um, it's interesting. You know, people have a lot of problem with social media. There's some good stuff for people like us. You know, yeah. we get to reach out to people that we would not normally met. I'm trying to figure out how I did this in the seventies and the eighties and nineties. Sure. How did I sustain a career? Right. I mean, Jesus, it was hard. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, that's what, that's what this was. You reach out to me saying yeah. that you wanted to come on and I'm glad, I'm glad you did. You know? Yeah. On, on Instagram, which is yeah. new for me. Yeah. 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 So on that, on that note, uh, obviously I already know the answer to the, are you on the socials? So, uh, yes. where can people reach out to you if they'd like to? 
Um, I do have a website with the Authors Guild. It's richardvetieriauthor.com. Okay. And I'm and on Facebook. I'm on Facebook because I, I like Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I know it's X, but I, I still call it Twitter. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. You, I, can I, you drop your handle? You, you want to drop your handle for people? or? I think it's Vetiri Richard. I, I got to oh. do better with that. But I yeah. love being on it because they got writing communities on Twitter. Sure. X. They got me, and I, I really like to respond – and actually, people have come to readings of mine saying, I know you on Twitter. And Instagram is like, is the is fun, but it's so visual. It's so visual. Sure. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't get the right much. So I'm really easily to find. Plus, I'm, I'm in New York. <laughs> you can run into me anywhere. And nice. I'm at the actor studio a lot. So good. Well, Richard Vacheri, thank you for coming out of the Playwright Spotlight. James, it was great fun, man. You be safe. Yeah, absolutely. You too. Thank you for turning into this episode of Playwright Spotlight. Again, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below, and share this channel with a friend. If you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, be sure to leave a five-star review and subscribe to the channel. And in the meantime, and until we see each other again in Season 3, keep writing. <laughs>